Hello, friends. Welcome to Minority Trip Report. MTR is a podcast for underrepresented views and life journeys with mental health, psychedelics, and consciousness. I'm your host, Rod Suraj. Today, my guest is Cece Lee, who is a senior data architect lead at Porta Sophia, a nonprofit online library for innovators and patent examiners to find relevant prior art in the field of psychedelics. She has a BSc in molecular and cellular biology and psychology from the University of Illinois. She has a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Wisconsin, where her research focused on the epigenetic and molecular mechanisms underlying depression and anxiety disorders. Cece was previously a research scientist at Gregor Diagnostics, a prostate cancer diagnostic startup. She also founded the BioFord Women in BioHealth Mentoring Program and is on the WIB Steering Committee. Cece is passionate about creating more connections among women in the BioHealth community. Cece, pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I was mentioning to you before we started recording that there's so many things I want to hit and I want to make sure we can talk about them because it's super exciting, very relevant. But before we get into that stuff, let's start at the very beginning. How I like these conversations to happen with my guests, I really want to know how they grew up, what makes them who they are, these formative experiences that we tend to have, whether it's like growing up in different parts of the world, what we studied, the books we read, our upbringing and things like that. So with that, you moved to the U.S. when you were 10 years old. I think there's a very particular stage of life, right? It's not like when you're moving to the U.S. when you're five years old, you don't really have many memories or a developed sense of self. But at 10 years old, you probably have memories from Beijing already. So I'm curious, having a hyphenated identity, what were your earliest memories moving from Beijing to the U.S., and how do you identify now? Great question. I definitely remember my early memories of moving to the U.S. It was a pretty profound change in my life. As you said, I moved to the U.S. when I was 10. I was actually raised by my grandparents in Beijing, China, but my mom, two years before I moved, so when I was eight, my mom had actually moved to the U.S. to follow her dreams in doing research at Northwestern University. So at 10 years mm. old, I came to Chicago or the U.S. and we had never talked about immigrating before she moved. So it was a pretty sudden change. And honestly, the biggest challenge was probably the language barrier and the culture barrier at 10 years old. And also in, in Chinese culture, be a good kid is really just like being obedient and getting <laughs> good grades, which is a very different from culturally what is be a good kid in the United States is. So I came here, biggest barrier was language and not really being able to speak to anyone one, not really having friends aside from my family. And then I remember going to school a week after I had come to the U.S. and finally gotten over the jet lag from that 13 hour difference. And then I, it was a Friday. I had worn my favorite dress. We went to the school I was going to attend. My mom and I had thought I was just going to register to be a student and then start the following week. But before I knew it, like they just took me away and uh, put me in class right away. And it was really disorienting just as, mm. as a child who had just come to a different country. I didn't speak the language. I had honestly never been near anyone who was not my race or who didn't speak my language ever before that. Because as China is a very homogenous population, really just Chinese people mainly. And it was very disorienting. And I remember going through the day, just not really knowing what's going on. I was just put to sit here in the classroom, look this way. And then it was lunchtime. And then we had PE class and I didn't have a gym uniform. So it was really like... I would say low-key traumatizing to be there in my favorite dress. And then it was not my favorite dress after that anymore, definitely. <laughs> but just that, that like disorienting feeling of not knowing was really hard. And then I remember reuniting with my mom at the end of the day. And then she was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this was going to happen. I didn't know you were going to start right away. And then I also believed her. It was the first realization that my mom didn't know, always know what was going to happen. And then I kind of had to like figure stuff out myself. That was really the first introduction of that idea of I might be learning things that my mom wouldn't know and just having to figure things out myself. So your mom was already in the U.S. And when you had moved, who did you move with? Did your mom go back and get you? So I had moved to the U.S. with my grandparents. She came two years before I did to work at Northwestern University. So it was my maternal grandparents, my Nina and Yeye came with me. And then we all looked together in a one bedroom apartment in downtown Chicago for the first year. Just so they helped me like adjust to American culture. And then they left after a year. And then it was just me and my mom from them. So what was it like for your grandparents? Were they familiar with Western culture and American culture by then? Or was it new for them as well? 
it was definitely new for them as well. I remember the phrase my grandparents learned, which was no English when anybody (laughs) talked to them. And that was basically what happened with every interaction. (laughs) (laughs) What did it feel like to see the U.S. from their eyes? Because you have a whole generational divide added on top of the fact that it's a very new culture. Looking at American culture from their eyes, I think it's a little bit different because they knew that they were going back to China and that China was their home. Whereas for my mom and I, we were coming to this place to start a new life, which was very different. So for them, it was like there was really no no pressure for assimilation to, to understand, get used to things. They were just there to support family, which they did tremendously for my mom and I. But it's a very different perspective. Your mom went to the U.S to pursue research and you in a way followed her footsteps, right? So what compelled her to move to the U.S.? So she was doing cancer research in in China, but she had worked with a visiting professor from Northwestern who was actually researching ALS, a lateral, and so like Lou Gehrig's disease. And she was really interested in this research and he had offered her an opportunity to come to the U.S. to work with him. And then on the other side as well, I mentioned that my mom is a single mom. My parents had been separated in China when I was two. At the time in China, I think having a non-traditional family was really taboo and looked looked Mm. down upon. So that was another contributing factor to her wanting to move to a different country and to just give me more opportunities, have a fresh start, really just be her. Tell me a little bit about Growing up with a single parent, what was that like? So I had, my grandparents were there with me before I was 10. And they, I mean, they are very loving and supportive, even though there is some intergenerational trauma that I'll talk about later with that. But I had really only met my dad once and it was right before leaving for China. And he also, he has multiple sclerosis. So he has had MS basically all of my life. So it's a very different experience. Pretty disorienting meeting my dad and then moving to the U.S. And then in the U.S., once my grandparents left, it was really just my mom and I. And I think think I think children of immigrants oftentimes they grow up a bit faster because when you're a child, you think your parents are these omnipotent beings. That if you're hungry, mm-hmm. they give you food. If you want anything, they provide it for you. They're all powerful. But then as an immigrant in a new country. I think you quickly realize that your parents might not know things and you're learning at the same time as your parents, but children have just such a faster ability to absorb, especially with language and learn. So I was finding myself learning things at the same rate and then eventually faster than my mom, especially when it comes to American culture. And so that was a a, like a pretty quickly, a quick wake up call of I I might need to like figure things out. And my mom was incredible. She used to, she worked in the lab and sometimes she would work weekends and nights and then she would bring me with her because we didn't really have childcare. And then I would just hang out in the conference room. (laughs) I was like, drink their hot chocolate in their cocktail. (laughs) And then look at nature articles with pretty pictures. (laughs) that's so cool you made a really actually really interesting observation i did not think of it that way before and i wonder what that relationship could have been or tends to be when kids are actually older so let's say if you moved there when you were 15 or 16 i can certainly imagine had i moved to canada with my parents i never moved with my parents i came to canada as a student my parents are still back in Bangladesh. i think that sort of curiosity that tendency to grow together might be truer if you're younger versus like older. I think it's one thing to see your parents being equally vulnerable or learning or might not know everything and to accept that. But I wonder what I would have been like being the rebellious troublemaker at 15 and watching my dad not know something. I wonder how I would have reacted. No, but that's a really interesting perspective. So in terms of absorbing American culture and Western culture in, in ways faster than your mom, what are some of the first things you absorbed? A distinct memory comes to mind where I think this was maybe sixth grade. We were, I was at a grocery store with my mom and we were checking out items. And then the grocery clerk had asked just very quickly, like paper or plastic, asked my mom that. <laughs> and then she was like frozen. She didn't know what to do. And then she looked at me and then he was like paper or plastic. And then I was like, paper (laughs) yeah but that was one of those things where it's i think it's common for parents like immigrants who have a harder time learning languages especially with accents too to then look to their children who often don't have accents and to be able to translate some of those things and i also wonder 10 is a very different age as like 15 Mm -hmm. developed a lot more of your identity so yeah it's very interesting what felt that most odd between 
the Chinese culture that you inherited and you grew up in until 10 and the sort of culture you are now forced to assimilate into? I think a big difference is like the Chinese culture is very group oriented. It's very, mm-hmm. very much like we are part of a group and that we sacrifice for the greater good of the group, mm-hmm. oftentimes the family unit. Whereas in America, it's very, it's a very individualistic, your own accomplishments type of culture. And I think that was a really big shift for me that in China, it was like, I just o- obeyed my grandparents and I was a good kid and then get good grades. And then in, Ch- in America, it was like, I had to figure out what was cool. Like how, what is, what is like cool in American culture and thinking for yourself is a very American concept that like really took a long time for me to really embody that. And there is also that pull, as you said, the hyphenated identity, the pull of the two cultures. I think when I was younger, coming right after I came to America, I I went to school in the in the city of Chicago. So I was fortunate to be around all quite a bit of diversity, people from different races, different class. Mm. And there was a lot of other immigrants in my school, especially attending my English as a second language class. So I was exposed to a lot of that. But I also very quickly realized that the dominant white culture is the the culture to strive for. Like we were all there, but then the cool people, the people in school, you even understand what high, lower status is. Yeah. The dominant white culture people. And so hence starting the process of assimilation into learning white culture, what is cool, individualism, achievements, those kind of things were valued much more than collectivism and, and working together. So that was not consistently still a pull. And even now, like I have spent my youth just learning what is the best in American culture and then complying in it, achieving success in this sense. I have been able to follow my dreams and work in psychedelics. And that is like very much not Chinese culture. But now I find myself missing that part. There's mm-hmm. a lot of respecting the elders, like filial piety, respect for your parents to pay back that love. A lot of those things that are just, I, I feel like I want to integrate those two aspects more. That's really well said. That's actually something I can deeply relate to. I think when people talk about collective identity or communism or whatever have you, I think it's still, everything has good and bad, right? But I think the mm-hmm. point you're trying to make is that is where the individual ends, the community begins. And what that really means is that at what point does aspects of duty and obligation mm-hmm. or responsibility, maybe not obligation, but I tend to think of it in terms of like duty, what are the things that you opt into in terms of, I want to care for people, I want to care for mm-hmm. my community, and that requires some level of sacrifice requires a level of humility, requires a level of selflessness that yeah. you need, right? To recognize yeah. that the community is bigger than me. Yeah. So I think those, those are really important aspects. I'm curious because you alluded to this already, which is you're already working in psychedelics. So in some ways, mm-hmm. you've chosen your own path. Now, do you think mm-hmm. that the friction point between the sort of community identity or collective identity and individualism, was that a little easier to reconcile because your mother being a single parent in facing the taboo that she faced in China and still, I'm sure, as a single parent of being a woman, it's also, it's already Mm -hmm. difficult no matter where you are. Was that a little easier because your mom was like, no, screw it, do your own thing? Did that feel easier or was that still very frictious? I think you you had on a really good point. I think it does feel easier because I have felt different with my mom being a single mom. Even in America, our Chinese friends we have, most of them come from very traditional families. So I think there there was always that sense of needing to, I don't know, prove myself that mm. just because my mom is a single mother, like her child can accomplish great things. And, and then also, I think it's, I don't know if this is part of just realizing it being in the environment or like my family telling me, but the sacrifices our parents make for our futures is very much in, it's very much like in my awareness always. <laughs> and it's not even like I have to go down this particular career path because of them, but just I have to do my best. I have to strive because of them. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting point too, because often I think I get that a lot. And my parents made incredible sacrifices. Mm-hmm. But the number of times my dad's, I didn't have shoes when I was your age. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I get it. But do you prefer that I don't have shoes? And so there's this sort of push and pull. But ultimately, I think the point you're making, is, at least the way I'm hearing it, is that you have to do your best. Whatever it is you do, the integrity, mm-hmm. do the best that you can do. And whatever that might be, whether it's art, science, performance, whatever. Absolutely. So 
moving from that, I want to come back to, because your mom did, has a similar pursuit in sciences and research and cancer research. You focused your attention to neuroscience and particularly mm -hmm. the neuroscience of how stress leads to psychiatric disorders, especially yeah. from the epigenetic perspective. Now, this, is, this feels super timely because stress yeah. and mental health is top of mind. I think stress is the, the silent killer everywhere, right? I think we're at this mm -hmm. point where it's starting to understand that stress is really at the root of all physiological and emotional issues, lack of a better word. Now, tell us a little bit about the work you're doing, particularly the connection between stress and psychiatric disorders. And then, of course, where does epigenetics come in this? And tell us what epigenetics is. What is it? What sort of insights did you gain from your work? So I will start with just my graduate work. I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison for my PhD. And really, I've always been interested in mental health and how people cope with stress, different stressors, and how come some people with the same stressor can develop a PTSD while others have post-traumatic growth. What is the molecular mechanism underlying these? And as they say, a lot of just me search, I really just wanted to understand for myself. But I studied mostly in the animal models, looking at, looking at epigenetic factors. So what I mean by epigenetics is, so we are, our genetic blueprint are the DNA codes, the nucleotides following each other. But that sort of lays out the blueprint for what gene expression and then downstream protein levels and then downstream behaviors that are associated with those. And so you can think of, the genes themselves as like a switch being there and it can be switched on or off. And so expression or no expression. And then you can think of epigenetics, epigenetic on top as a modification that sort of sets the dial where you could have a higher or lower in this range of expression level. So it's one way of modifying gene expression without actually changing the basic genetic codes like mutations. And so what we know from epigenetics and with the marker that I said is that it is, it is susceptible to environmental factors. So environmental stressors and things can change epigenetic profiles. So it can change how much gene expression happens. And so the particular marker that I studied was 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. So it's a methyl group on top of the cytosine, the nucleotide cytosine. And then depending on how, how many genes have this methyl group, you can increase or decrease gene expression levels. And, and because 5-HMC, the marker that I study, unlike the more commonly studied just methylcytosine, is more susceptible to environmental factors. And that kind of gave me the hope of like, if a bad stressor could cause downstream and lasting epigenetic effects and gene expression changes and behavior changes associated with de psychiatric disorders like depression, anxiety, or PTSD, then perhaps good environmental factors like exercise or meditation could also affect, or nutrition could affect these markers as well and maybe reverse the detriment that we see as well. And so, and your comment about stress being one of the main reasons of these psychiatric disorders we see, especially in the era of COVID, a tremendous stressor, unprecedented, especially frontline workers. You know, stress at a low level is actually really beneficial when you think about stressors like exercise puts stress on your body, but then you get benefits on the yeah. other side. Your body is actually very resilient and it's meant to deal with these acute stressors very effectively through the stress response, HPA axis. It's activated. Your body deals with it. Stressors gone. And then you're all, you're back to normal and it helps you deal with stressors like that better in the future. But the problem with a lot of these stress-induced psychiatric disorders is that it's constant and it, it, the stress never goes away. So that your body adapts to this new norm. So when the stressor does go away, it's still adapting to this new norm. And so it doesn't, like your brain haven't quite caught up. In the case of PTSD, and you think it, the, the triggers are still there, but it's actually not physically there. But your brain is kind of stuck in that routine, which leads nicely to psychedelics in terms of the things that we know about psychedelics and its ability for neuroplasticity to, to disintegrate the default mode network, which is often associated with these psychiatric disorders. They can alter brain connectivity, so making the regions that don't normally speak to each other talk to each other again. So that's part of the interesting thing about what psychedelics can do epigenetically. So let me see if I got this correctly. Mm -hmm. You were studying the effect of persistent stressors on the, let's just say, conditional expression of particular genes. 
right? In this particular case, what sort of persistent stressors were you studying? So I was mainly using animal models. And so we had two types. We had acute stress, which is just like a one-time stressor. It could be like an electric shock or a forced swim test or an animal odor, like a predator odor, a fox odor. Or the other type, which is very interesting, is what we call the chronic variable stretch. Stress. Really? So it's chronic all, over a long period of time, sometimes weeks for the mice. That's pretty chronic. And then they're variable. They're all like low, very low key stressors that do not do direct harm, such as like white noise at night, saturated wet bedding, being separated or lights on when it's their dark period. So these are all like individually would not be very stressful. And just as much as you can imply from animal models, these would be, I would guess, like the daily things that come up that aren't like dangerous, but are chronic and also variable. They're unpredictable. You just mentioned that in isolation, maybe an acute stressor could actually lead to resilience. But is the persistence or persistent exposure to the stressor that could actually could lead to some sort of conditioning, which I guess PTSD is some form of conditioning, where like even after the event is over, your brain and your mind is still conditioned to respond as if that stressor was still there. Where is the line between where an acute stressor becomes a persistent stressor in terms of how your mind models it? I think that depends on the individual and then what amount of maybe perhaps stress they have experienced before. When I was in grad school, I went to this seminar that gave a really interesting concept called stress, stress inoculation, like a stress vaccine where they would stress. I think this was primate. They would give very low stress, increasingly stress, stressful stimulus to, to, to the subject. And then they were much more able to regulate themselves if they were stress inoculated with the vaccine, like they knew what to do, but we're we're talking oh. about one time and then you have a pretty similar experience afterwards that you can recall upon that. But but I think what you're talking about with the chronic stress is never quite having get back getting back to the base level. And in the case of PTSD with veterans, it is very adaptive at the time for them oh. to respond and for your brain to respond in the way that it does. And but it's just it's harder for the brain when the stressor goes away, but you're still quite in, in it. And there are epigenetic changes that happens from that, that it's just harder to reset. There's so many things that I'm thinking about, as you mentioned, that word stress and inoculation. And I wonder what kind of social factors could be actually very effective stress inoculators. I think about a year and a half ago, while we were in the depth of the pandemic, there were these articles talking about, oh, the mental health effect of pandemic is not as bad, but there's a nuance here. It's not as bad for people who actually have a sense of community who feel mm -hmm. that they're in a safe mm -hmm. community with people, loved ones, that they feel protected. It was the people without it that had mm -hmm. the most harmful, experienced the most harmful effect, mental health effects of the pandemic. The thing that I'm thinking about is a sort of in terms of stress inoculation, what are some of the social factors going back to, again, they, which may have epigenetic expression that are very effective leaders. So what are your, what's your thought on that? I think having community and social connection is huge for us humans in order to regulate. I think one of the, one of the ways to lower cortisol level is hug from another person is just like that face-to-face -face interaction. That's one of the ways where we have evolutionarily, let's say we're, we're in the woods and then suddenly we see a predator and we're chased by it. The HPA it axis activate, we run. We finish, we outrun the predator, and then we come back to our, our cave with our home, our community, and then we know we're safe. And so then the cortisol levels decrease, oxytocin kicks in, and then we can basically reset our nervous system to tell it now we're safe. Whereas I think people, especially when you start in the COVID pandemic with those sort of strong bonds, it's very, very good for our nervous system to come back, mm. social interactions. Did you see some of the remediative effects of stress inoculation in any of your animal model studies? Because often I find we do these animal model studies to look at the impacts or the bad parts, but we don't look at what actually would cause, what would repair some of those harms. I personally, I did not do look at that in my research, but it's something that I'm very interested in. Exactly. I think a lot of academia really focuses on the illnesses and not as much on the other side of the spectrum, like positive psychology, how, how these things could strengthen our ways of coping. Yeah. There's this one example. I think there's a very frequently cited example of, oh, we gave rats in a cage cocaine. 
water versus mm-hmm. normal water, and they got addicted to cocaine water, and they all became addicted to the cocaine water. But I think this was, and that's, that was supposed to like prove something about human nature, where if you give people some sort of addictive thing, we'll all choose to be addicts. But the nuance is, I think that researcher experiment was like disproven in its hypothesis because they replicated the same experiment, but they also had this other like alternative, which is, okay, we gave the same rats that were previously in this cage, but now we put them in what is equivalent to an amusement park. Lots mm-hmm. of like social time, a lot of interaction mm-hmm. with other mice and rats and stuff like that. And then we gave them cocaine water versus the normal water. Guess what? They weren't addicted to cocaine water. Yeah. Again, modeling what these studies are supposed to say about human nature, because then, of course, we take the animal studies and say, oh, it was true for this sort of subset of animal models. So it must be true for human nature because there's some sort of some sort of like overlap between the genetic code and things like that. Right. I think it's so fascinating. Okay, so let's now move to. You touched on this briefly, is that psychedelics then create an opening or at least impose another alternative to how the mind may work when faced Mm -hmm. with acute stressors or persistent stressors. What are some Mm -hmm. of those key findings that you you saw? Sure. So before I get into the findings, I want to just kind of put out an analogy for how to think about this. In the case of, let's say, a mental illness like depression, a lot of times you have rumination going on. You're just thinking the same negative self-talk. And you can think of it as a downhill ski. And I think this is an analogy that I'm definitely stealing from another place that I read it and found very insightful. But uh, let's say, you know, it was Robert Carhart Harris. Oh, is it? Yeah, we'll just put that in perspective and then we can bring it back to that analogy. But just having a downhill skier is going to start forming tracks. And then the more that they go down the track, the harder it is for them to veer off track. They can only stay where they are. And then the more the more neurons fire together, the more they fire together, the more they wire together. So those pathways are very set in. Whereas psychedelics, as he refers, is like a fresh coat of snow. And now you don't have these tracks that are laid out. And then now the skier can go whichever way they want. They can have new thoughts about improved self-talk. And so with psychedelics, there is there is disintegration or a dampening of the default mode network, which is often associated with depression. And the default mode networks are the regions in the brain that are active when you're just not particularly focusing on the task. A lot of the times when you're daydreaming, also when you're ruminating. And so that's been decreased. And there's also been research that shows a decrease in the default mode network is also associated with meditation. And then it can also alter these brain connectivity, so with different regions, and that's a big form of neuroplasticity. And then in terms of animal research, I've seen one study where it was looking at, I think, DOI, which is a serotonin receptor agonist synthesized by Alexander. It has similar effects as compared to LSD, I think people have said. And they've given uh, DOI, this psychedelic compound, to, I think, mice. And then saw gene expression changes as well as histomodifications. What you were talking about before, just how tightly the DNA are wound around the histone proteins kind of contributes to determine how what how much a gene expression can happen. Um, so they've seen histomodifications, which is an epigenetic marker with DOI in mice, and then they've also, I think. One of the first studies in epigenetics pretty recently was looking at ayahuasca and people who have drink ayahuasca taking their saliva samples. And then you can look at epigenetic markers in the saliva samples and then have seen changes in DNA methylation on, I think they just looked at three genes that are associated with stress-induced psychopathology genes that are also associated with the HPA axis. And then they've seen changes in DNA methylation levels from the drinking ayahuasca. So those are very interesting findings. And I think the convergence of epigenetics and and psychedelics is inevitable, but it's very new. (laughs) Yeah, it's fascinating. I feel like humanity has forever been debating nature versus nurture, right? This is just another crazy sort of layer on top of that but now we actually it's, have the tools and we have these ancient medicines and these two coming together and now we can actually form some correlations the secret is yeah. of course we have to wait to see is ultimately how much do we attribute to correlation and imposition of science I feel like mm-hmm. sometimes we get in the realm of phenotyping really hard 
about something mm-hmm. we actually don't know. There's simple correlation, but it's not actually direct causation. You know what I mean? Coming to the commercial realm and the work mm-hmm. you're doing at Porta Sophia now, have this background in science and molecular biology, epigenetics, and looking at the connection between stressors and psychiatric disorders. But now mm-hmm. you actually come to the realm of commercial science, which is really the realm of patents, and then applied mm-hmm. to psychedelics, which is, again, super timely. Particularly in the last gen, I think we're in a much better place to have a mature conversation about what is patentable, what should be Mm -hmm. patents, or even to ask, what the hell are patents? And why Mm -hmm. do patents even exist? Before we get into the philosophical space, tell us a little bit about what Porta Sophia does. Why Mm -hmm. does it exist? So Porta Sophia is a nonprofit. It's an online psychedelic prior art library, and it's free for everyone to use as a resource. And so Porta Sophia came about, I think, in early 2021. I really, in response to what was happening in the psychedelic landscape, especially around intellectual property. So we know that in the last decade, there's been a huge resurgence in mainstream interest in psychedelics. And because of that, there's a lot of commercial interest. Like you said, a lot of universities are doing research. The media is covering it more and more in the last decade. And because of that, there's also been an increase in intellectual property. So specifically in this case, just patent. And and so a patent, just to give a little background, is a government granted, a government issued right to monopolize an invention and to exclude others from making, using, or selling the said invention, but for a limited period of time. And so that's a patent. And the whole, the point of patent actually dates back to the 1400s in Europe. And it was actually meant to stimulate innovation by allowing inventors to disclose their new technology into the public domain so that one else can be aware of it, but still allowing them those exclusive rights to benefit from these inventions. So as a public good, to push on public knowledge forward and incentivize people to invent things. And so that was the original idea. So a patent should only be issued if it is novel. It is non-obvious. So novel meaning that there's never been anything done like that before, that has been recorded. And then non-obvious meaning someone of ordinary skill in that field would would not find the invention like an obvious thing. And then it's also, it should be useful. And so those are the basic requirements. And also you cannot patent an invention twice. And so those are the basic fundamental requirements for a good patent. At least that was that was what the intent is in the patent space. And that works very well in other fields. But psychedelics, because of the unique history of psychedelics, it's been around for thousands of years in indigenous communities and is being practiced there. And then it, um, but it has, It really came to the Western world in like the 50s, 60s, and maybe early 70s. But there was also the prohibition and everything was outlawed. And so there's a really big gap. A lot of that research went underground in places that are hard to find for the legal system or the people working in the legal system. And so it's really not in this last decade or so when mainstream academic research has picked up or any companies even you know, went near it. And so because of this gap and psychedelics being illegal for so long, there's there's a really big gap in knowledge of people who are the patent examiners. So these are the lawyers working, let's say, in the U.S. for the United States Patent Trademark Office to decide if a patent should be issued. So they're judging the novelty, the non-obviousness. They determine if this patent application is new and should be granted, there's a lack of just the knowledge of people who are patent examiners and also a breadth of knowledge in psychedelics because of the history. Mm -hmm. Because of that, there's been a lot of patent applications that are claiming. So the claims basically outlines the legal rights, the specifics of the legal rights. So they're claiming things that are already in the public domain that has already been used or is documented elsewhere. And so these are not novel things, but they're not in places that an examiner would be able to find. And also this is something that people probably don't know, but at least in the U.S., an examiner usually only gets about 19 hours to go through a a patent in its entirety from seeing it to deciding if it should be granted. And some of the senior ones only take 12 hours. So they're always going to go to their own patent databases first. And there's not a lot of historical patents on psychedelics that they could just pull up. Whereas in other fields, other molecular genetics, other technologies, it's easy to find that prior art. And any of these information available, public information is called prior art. And that's why we, Port Sophia, as a prior art library, we had manually go in and curate these prior art references. And that's from journal articles, old patents. We look at blogs, websites, books, um, 
plate archival research. So we look at all of these sources to, to make it really easily digestible for the examiners to use us and also applicants. Okay, so let me bring this all together into what I heard and what I understand. For a patent to be genuine, and I think patents are a good thing because they incentivize mm -hmm. innovation. Now, the question is, what mm -hmm. is a good patent rather than whether patents are good or not? A good patent means that something is genuine, the novel. By novel, I mean it's something that is does not exist in the public domain, is not prior art essentially, meaning that there's no pre-existing knowledge that somebody with ordinary skills, and I'm in quotation marks, ordinary skills would not be able to replicate that. So that preserves the expertise that someone may develop over their life or through training and stuff like that, that they won't be able to develop. And then that invention that generally novel invention has a particular use that is also novel. Now, where the trouble comes is that, like you said, that we had almost 50 years of prohibition where the research went underground or simply disappeared. Uh, there's a huge gap in knowledge. Now, where things get interesting and political, and all science, I believe, is political ultimately because it is subject to the access, the infrastructure, and the awareness of people. Where people are involved, it's going to be political. So you have, let's say, somebody applying for a patent and making these claims. Genuine or not, they're making claims. Somebody at the patent office, like you said, a lawyer, who will then spend on average 19 hours, to your point, determining the validity of that claim. Now, for areas of knowledge where there's a large prior art and a public library and a public domain that is rich with knowledge, that mm -hmm. might be easy. For areas of psychedelic science, which has been stigmatized and criminalized, that has basically disappeared for 50 years, a patent officer may go, oh, this is genuine because I can't find anything that exists before this, which might be completely wrong because research, despite existing, is not easily accessible. If it takes 50 hours versus 19, somebody will be like, oh yeah, I can't find anything on Google. Okay, damn, patent approved. There you go. Make money for 10 years. That's really what's happening, right? Fascinating. I find it so fascinating. So your Protosophia is essentially protecting the public domain by making what does exist in the in prior art and the public domain, making it more obvious and accessible to patent mm -hmm. office, right? Absolutely. That's the goal of Protosophia. We want to support good patents, stimulate innovation, and assure that these medicines can be accessible at scale so people who need them. All of the things that we're doing is a support of the, that mission of ours. And then in terms of making prior art accessible. So we build this library and that's for anyone to use uh, patent examiners as well as inventors, as well as just general public who's mm. interested in, in, in prior art and psychedelic literature. We have two prongs to our strategy and the other strategy are our third party pre-issuance submission efforts. And I think this is something that you'd be really interested in. So this is a way working within the legal system in the U.S. and in other countries in the U.S. where we can, as a third party, submit prior art directly to the examiner in the, in the process of their examination. So we can actually, in our prior art search, so patents are published on a weekly basis, patent applications, and then every week we go in and look at the newly published applications, and then we track, we have 33 compounds that we're tracking, psychedelic compounds, we finished 12 of them, comprehensive search of all the patents regarding those. And then so we evaluate these patent applications and sort them into three tiers. And then tier one is the most, we would say overly broad patents. So those those are the, the claims that are claiming existing knowledge. Those are like overly broad without data in the application to support the scope of the claims. There could be a threat to the field if these are granted. And also we look at the applicants. So are they filing multiple overly broad applications? And so for the ones that we deem to be overly broad, we file third-party submissions on the select few of those. And so with these, it's basically compiling a chart where it's like the verbatim claims on the left and then the evidence, the excerpts of evidence on the right. So it makes it really easy for patent examiners to, when they receive this, and they're obligated to account this in their examination process. And also the applicants receive notification that somebody has filed a third-party admission on them, their application. And this makes it really easy for examiners because they basically get sent this evidence 
And then they can use that to determine if the claims need to be narrowed, if they're just rejected. And we have filed 12 third-party submissions and also observations internationally in different countries. And we've seen some really incredible impact already in the first mm. three that was filed starting February. Applicants have actually amended their claims and narrowed them in scope. They've taken out the overly broad claims, replaced them with more uh, just the specific compounds that they're focused on. And then we actually had a recent one where it was an application claiming using psilocybin and other psychedelics to treat headaches, which have had extensive research. And so we provided the third-party submission and the USPTO actually just announced that they had a non-final rejection of this application. They had actually said based on the prior art submitted during the third party submission that we filed. Mm. So it's really great to actually see impact that we're making in this space with both the library and these third party submissions. That's really interesting because usually what will happen is that some entity would file a very broad claim. And then of course, another party can dispute that claim through an appeals process, but it's very time consuming resources and money. What you're doing is you're preempting that appeal process by filing a claim and saying that, just so you know, FYI, <laughs> this already exists. So if anybody attempts it in the future, just so you know, this already exists. That's essentially what you're doing. Exactly. And so we actually have one of our colleagues present at Horizons, just describing our process and our progress. And so on average, it takes us about, let's say, 40 to over 100 hours to file one of these. So they're very lengthy, like, work but but when it comes to what you're talking about like challenging a patent after its issue like the post grant review process that could be sometimes in the millions of dollars with a yeah. lot of costly time commitment and it often takes possibly over a thousand hours of legal experts time so personal first intervention really is in the front end the the prior art stage before a patent is issued to provide that information to the examiners at the early stage so we don't have to waste a lot of money on patent litigation. I wonder whether Porta Sophia, if it wasn't for psychedelics, something like Porta Sophia should would ever exist. Because you wouldn't need to, because you have a really rich ecosystem of knowledge already. You exist by virtue of vision that happened. Now there's this huge mm -hmm. gap in the cultural consciousness about awareness about what these psychedelics are. I can't say for sure, but I would guess so because these patent examiners are incredibly skilled lawyers who are experts in their field. And it is like a very common strategy in patenting to go as broad as you can initially. It's a stance of patent examiner restricts and then you amend the claims and then you figure out the set that works. Up. You can claim the most things without overstepping, but then that doesn't really work with this field because of that gap. So that's why Persophia was created and now we're here. Interesting. Okay, I have one last question and we're going to switch gears. You said that you're focused on 33 molecules in mm -hmm. particular. What determines that number? So these are the most common molecules. Things like psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, those are all up at the very front. And then as we get more into obscure ones, so this is just a short list that we're continuing to add every time we get feedback from the community or we're seeing trends that are currently in applications that come out, we add more to this list. So 33 is like our comprehensive prior, our, our comprehensive patent search that we use, but a lot of these patents cover 50 different compounds. And so those are all in our database as well. Oftentimes overly broad patents will claim multiple compounds, not mm. just the one that they're focusing. So those are all in our database for future references. And when we look, when we add prior art to our library, which we do add on a weekly basis. We That prior art is directly from the patent themes that we're seeing in the latest applications that are mostly tier one, tier three, starting with tier one. Not a comprehensive library, but it is a library enriched in patent-related themes, which is what we're mainly after. Of course, and ultimately the goal is to make the whole ecosystem better, right? You have to mm -hmm. start somewhere and prioritize what are the most commercially valuable ones. Amazing. I feel like I could talk about this section alone forever, but yeah. we do have other really important things to discuss. So I'm going to switch gear, take a hard right. I think it's important to come down to the personal level, right? Because ultimately mm -hmm. that's the source of conviction for people like you, people like me, why do we do the work that we do? What was your most meaningful psychedelic experience? Why was it meaningful? And please feel free to share whatever you feel 
is appropriate to share on a podcast? Yeah, this is a great question. And to be honest, I have thought a lot about what I want to share. And I will say that I have had one significant psychedelic experience. I will go into the details of what compound or one or with who. And that is really because I am in the psychedelic space and working in the space, but there are these powerful compounds are still illegal in the U.S. And oh, we have to oh. remember that there is like my upbringing, all the rules, there is like definitely still real fear about even talking about these. And there is stigma. And that's also one of the reasons why it's so important to talk about it, to destigmatize them for people of my, my culture as well, who really could benefit from mm -hmm. these very powerful medicine. And so for, for my experience, it was a couple of years after graduate school, and I had really experienced some deep depression, a, a few bouts of just severe depression, almost debilitating, as well as anxiety. In, during graduate school, I had panic attacks where it was so bad that I, I would lose my vision. I would see purple. I would feel mm. tingling in my arm, like shortness of breath, and then tightness of chest. I basically not be able to continue to function. And I remember driving from campus to other parts of the building for research and then just having, carry my sample, but then feeling like an anxiety attack, panic attack come on and then having to pull over on the side of the road to ride it out. So mm. this was like pretty severe anxiety and depression. And I had really spent a lot of time, I was doing everything I can to try to heal myself. I was seeing a psychiatrist. I was on SSRIs. I tried multiple combinations, different drugs. I was exercising, meditating, all of the things you could name. And it just was not helping with the depression, anxiety. It was really in a very desperate place. And eventually the SSRIs like worked, but then there was terrible side effects. And then after graduate school, I had come off of them and then, but was like still feeling the low key depression, not debilitating, but still feeling it. And then I had learned about psychedelics and just the incredible potential for therapeutic potential of these. And then, so I tried them and it really, I just cried for the first two hours. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I just felt I just cried so much and like just purged all of the sadness and the fear that I was having. And then after the crying session, it was really just like a deep sense of safety, which like I honestly, before that moment, could not recall the last time that I had felt that safe, maybe even since childhood, just this deep sense of safety and a deep sense of like belonging and love and that I was not alone. And, and I think like the, for me, really the takeaway was that like, like when you're in depression or in fear, like understanding the concept of safety that you are technically pretty safe versus feeling a sense of safety mm. is very different. It's like a description of a taste versus actually tasting it. It's very different. And it's just for a very long time, I had felt safe. And I was like thinking, reflecting on that, just I feel like psychedelics could have such tremendous potential with like racial trauma and trauma from immigration, just feeling that sense of safety, potentially for the first time to be completely like mm. safe. It's just, I think that could have huge potentials. Yeah. And it's something that I had just, and the side effects of SSRIs are just awful and it only works for select few, select population and the effects decrease with time. So I think and it just reaffirmed my sense of community, like my sense of belonging to myself, to my own authenticity and history and background and culture. It just, it's, it just felt, I felt safe and I didn't feel shame. It was really transformative. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. This is perhaps a loaded question, but I'm curious how, knowing what you know now, the work that you do, everything that you shared about epigenetics, but also upbringing, you talked about feeling a profound sense of safety and belonging for the first time, what do you attribute to not feeling that way prior to psychedelics? Yeah, I think, I think when it comes to safety, just like the sense that you, the way that you are is all right is a huge part of that. And then I think because of my immigrant experience and also being oftentimes the only minority mm -hmm. in the room, it feels like, it feels like I have, like I have to be a certain way in order to feel safe. And I, that's always so integrated. And, and I think psychedelics really just brought up the idea of that I can just be like, I can be who I am and that's okay. That's especially, 
I mean, leading to the pandemic, COVID-19, especially in 2020, with the increase in hate crimes against mm. Asians and Asian Americans. I really, during the early phase of the pandemic was when I had experienced very covert danger and mm. from racism for the first time. There's been very covert racism throughout growing up in, in the 2000s, 90s. But this sense of I could be, I'm just walking down the street, walking my dog, but then I have a Chinese face. And also at the time hearing like political narratives of the Ch China virus and go back to your country, these kind of things where it's like I would be watching the street and then this was like the fight between the mask mandate as well. And it's like very common in Asian cultures to wear masks to protect yourself when you're sick, like for other people to not be contagious. And like I had never really thought about walking down the street with my face and also wearing a mask and being a political statement and a political risk. And then also like just talking to my mom she lives by herself in Chicago and she goes to Chinatown to get groceries because there are Chinese vegetables that are only available in Chinese grocery stores and then just thinking talking to her I remember during the peak of those the fears and then just her describing that Chinatown is like desolate and there's no one around and there's yeah. really like tension when you're there grocery shopping that everybody is on edge and you could just feel it and that fear and sense for safety that there could be a shooting or there could be like violence is really terrifying and I worry for my mom and it's also like Chinatown is usually a tourist place where there's like bustling and everyone's eating at restaurants there's people taking pictures so that was like a very dramatic shift for me in terms of the sense of safety and I, I also recognize that like it is very privileged of me to really have only recognized that the sense of safety walking down the street with my face as a Chinese person, I know people, African Americans, people of other race have experienced this their entire life. It's not just because of a pandemic. And so just, I think a lot of this awareness and for the first time, it really dawned on me during this critical mm. time. We talk about personal liberation in one way with psychedelics, but I think to understand where you fit in the larger picture is also equally liberating, right? Because again, mm -hmm. going back to the idea of duty and responsibility gives you a sense of, okay, this is where I am. This is how I fit in with everything else. This is how I am in the general ecosystem. And mm -hmm. from that, now that I'm free, what do I do? What can mm -hmm. I do? What should I do? And I think mm -hmm. that's really important. So I want to bring us to the last part of the conversation. You're doing a lot of work, particularly with the building coalitions and alliances of people with similar lived experiences. Going off what you just mentioned, your experience with psychedelics and also seeing what was happening in your community, the Chinese American community, particularly in the pandemic, why is work like this important? And why is it important to build alliances of people with similar lived experience? I think it's really important to build community. Having a sense of community and just humans supporting each other is build evolutionary in our genes. Living a good life is to have that connection with other people and the larger world around us. And so with Women About Health, so this is a mostly Wisconsin located group. And I've been in this network for five years and it's really creating networking opportunity, career advice, like just connection among women in the bell health industry. And, and so this last year, I helped co-found this mentorship program and mentorship has been so important to me too. I feel like I have really seeked out and have received great mentorship throughout my career and my personal life that has led me to, to the things that I've been able to experience today. And I've had a really great mentors that have helped me with career advice. And I wanted to be able to bring that to my community. I've experienced a, what is a first round mentorship program a couple of years ago. And I just, I just loved my mentor. She was incredibly helpful. And she actually wrote a recommendation for me, for one of an application that I honestly read her recommendation letter when I feel down about my son yeah. to pick me up. So I think it's so important for mentorship and supporting each other, making that connection. I created the mentorship program last year that was a pilot program and that was just really great and successful. We made really great connections, especially in COVID. I think there is really a lack of feeling to, to other people that I think this program helps offer. And we're actually in the middle of, of ramping up for the second round of women in mentorship, women about health mentorship program. And with the Asian Psychedelic Coalition, this is a pretty new effort. And Sarah so reached out to me. She is the lead for this, this effort. And we're just connected, coming from different backgrounds. And I think the 
Asian Americans, Asian Canadians, the Asian diaspora. There is so much diversity within what is labeled Asian. So we've come together, a group of people with such diverse backgrounds and in this field, wanting to connect more, to just live meaningfully, to bring more activism, awareness, education, more resources. And it is something where I think there is a need in the psychedelic space, like a lot of academic research is mostly Caucasian subjects. And that's a big problem in this field. Like someone like my mom who has struggled from depression, there are really no Mandarin speaking psychedelics therapists, let alone it's hard to find a Mandarin speaking like psychiatrist, even in city of Star Wars of Chicago. She would not be able to receive these, these therapeutics because of the lack of diversity. I feel like I'm in a position that can make a difference now and use my voice to be able to advocate for people to to destigmatize and building community is a big part of that. And I think a big part of the effects of psychedelics is feeling connectedness with other people, open-mindedness. And I think part of just living a good life is also connectedness. What a beautiful way to bring it together. You talked about stress inoculators, and here we are talking mm-hmm. about community, right? That's perhaps the most important aspect of building resilience and building a sense of belonging. Cece, this was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for spending the time with me and hanging out with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for highlighting the voices of the less heard. That is really important work. This podcast was produced in collaboration with Carolyn Tripp on art design. Thanks for listening to Minority Trip Report. I'm your host, Rod Siraj.